Good morning. Good morning, Rabotai. Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today is dedicated to loving memory. And Lilui Nishmat Menachem Galapo Ben Chana, sponsored by Abraham Galapo. As well, the month of Kobru, dedicated in honor of Rachel Sai, donated by her children. Breakfast in the Class, dedicated in honor of Sammy and Michaela in celebration of their marriage. May they be blessed always with all the best. Mabruk, all of their friends at the Congregation Beit Edmund, a.k.a. EJSS. Um, the week of breakfast in the class as well is dedicated to loving memory of Sinai Tour Chosh Baksh. Aleya Shalom, Yudish Mat Sinai Tour Bat Shokrola, sponsored by his son Maurice Chosh. By dedicated to loving memory of Mr. Lilith Safra, Yudish Mat, Lea Bat Khan, our philanthropy has reached so many throughout the world. And finally, the week of Kobru is uh, dedicated in honor of David E. Ash and his substantial capacity to do good today and every day. Hazaku Baruch. My friends, we have um, a, a very interesting expression when it comes to uh, Noach. The Torah tells us, Noach, Noach ish tzadik, tamim bedorotav. Noach was a righteous man, tamim he was whole, he was pure, he was wholesome, he was innocent, bedorotav, in his generations. Now, it's an interesting expression that the Torah is opining on the level of Noah. Like as an example, does the Pasuk say, and Avraham was a tzaddik, righteous? Does it say that? Does it tell us about Yosef, about Yaakov? Why is it mentioning about Noah that Noah is righteous? Why is it telling us that? And my friends, I think there's a very interesting uh, observation to make based on this. That comes a little bit after the Torah is written, right? So what, in the Torah, what's the answer? Yeah? So there's a really interesting answer to this. And the answer to that is hidden in the word toldot. Ele toldot noach. What does toldot mean? Literally toldot means these are the generations or the children of. Okay? Like, your, like yeled, toldot. Uh, Leholid. These are the generations of, these are the children of Noah. Now, what's interesting is that, what's the very next Pasuk, Sammy? El Todo Noah. Noah is the thing I have to What comes after that? That's really what should come after the words, El Todo Noah. By the way, we have a Pasuk very similar to this. Where does it say? Ele todot. Avraham. Avraham olid et Yitzchak. So you see, that's how the sentence should be structured. These are the children of Avraham. Who is the children of Avraham? Avraham gave birth to Yitzchak. So it should have said, these are the children of Noach. Avra- Noach gave birth to three sons. Et Shem, et Cham, et Yafet. And the answer, I think, is something very powerful. The answer is, that I don't need to tell you in the Torah who Abraham, who Yitzchak, and Yaakov were. You know why? Because who their children have become speaks to who they were. So therefore, if you want to know who Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov are, no problem. Go look at the fact that the children of these people became Am Yisrael, became the people who taught the world, its, who get, you know, gave the world its moral compass that became a light unto the nations, that received the Torah from God on high. That's how you know who Avraham is. That's Toldot, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. So therefore the Torah doesn't need to tell you who the person was. However, when the children of a person and the descendants of a person don't give, they don't bear witness by their actions who the father, who the grandfather was, the Torah wants to make sure, like we say, Zecher, Tzadik, and when we mention a tzaddik, it's done so in the proper way, with the proper respect, and that his memory is literally a blessing. So therefore the Torah tells us something remarkable. You know what the outcropping, the toldot of Noach are? If we can't discern from Yoshve Tevel, from the whole earth, all of the world is Noach's children. So there's no discernible line, there's no identifying feature, there's no... 
uh, achievement that crowns and teaches us from looking at the children of the world that Noah was a righteous man. So therefore the Torah needs to come and tell us who Noah was and making sure that we understand this. Now the rabbis explain that the word toldot means something that came from something. Now the Gemara explains that the children of tzaddikim are their actions. And what that means is that the same way a person's children exist because of what they've done, right? So as an example, I created these kids, therefore they are toldot uh, shilomo as an example. So too are the actions of a person considered to be their children. Remarkable. Do you hear that? The actions of a person are considered to be their children. So much so that you could describe because they came from you. Without you, they would not exist, those actions. They are, you birthed each one of those things, of those ideas, of those goals, of those things that you built, the business, the uh, relationships. They are a person's children. So much so that we could say, Ele toldot noach, noach is tzaddik. My friends, based on this, I want to share that I, there's something here that I think is very interesting. You know, for many people, the legacy that they leave in this world is the children that they leave behind them. But there's people actually whose children don't actually carry on the ways of their father. You know, the other day I met someone I knew a long time ago. Uh, he's the son of a rabbi. I, I don't want to, you know, speak badly. I mean, even if you don't know who he is, but let's just say it's not so rabbinic what he's doing with his time. It's, if, if, if you could choose the opposite path in life to being a, a rabbi, a person who's devout with mitzvot, with Torah, with integrity, this guy is literally the exact opposite. So what happens when a person's a tzaddik, when his legacy is not carried on through his children. The answer is that the legacy that the person leaves in this world becomes the decisions that they make. And I know it's a crazy thing to think, but the Mishnah mentions that if a person is, uh, wants to be able to stay on the straight and narrow, he should think to himself, or she should think to herself, they should remind themselves of the fact that the time will come when they will no longer be here. And in the end, what difference will it made? Will it have made that they walk the face of this earth? All those efforts, all that time that you put in at work, all that time that you went to study in school, in university, you got, you got that degree, for what? What was it for? What did you do with it? All the effort that you put in, did it even make a difference? In the scheme of things, did it even matter? That's what the Mishnah says. So we're learning about Noah, the Torah is telling us that even if, as an example, from the descendants of Noah, we can't draw a line and see this is who Noah was, the Torah says, let me tell you a little bit about this fellow. My friends, I was reading the other day a little bit about uh, Cham Ben Sion Abba Shaul. Now Cham Ben Sion was one of the great poskim of the Sephardic uh, nation in the last, God knows how long, but less than 100, 200 years, he's a shining light as a posek for the Jewish people. Cham ben Sion Abashaul. He actually was Persian. Um, that's where he came from. He was, kind of came from Persia, um, Iran. And he became a tremendous Talmi Chacham. His mother used to ask everyone that she would meet, bless me that my child should be a Talmi Chacham. And the child that was born to her from a very young age was a very special child. But for all of his Torah knowledge, you know, one of the amazing things that you read about this, guy, about this fellow is the way he interacted with the people in his life. And I just want to share a little bit about Cham Ben Sion Abba Sha'ul, what it looks like to build legacy, to create and to have a narrative of your life that the life that you lived was worth living, it was worth speaking about. There was something there. I remember once seeing an advertisement for the army. They had this super high octane, you know, 30 second commercial. 
people, guy jumping out of planes, guy running across, liberating, you know, some hostages from a from a terrorist cell, like crazy, high, you know, shooting like this, running, find the plane taking off in the air. And then the end of it said, if your life was a movie, would anyone want to watch it? And I thought to myself, you know, what they're trying to sell you on is that it's a really good thing to lead a really exciting life. And I just imagine, what if the Torah made that same advertisement? Right? What would they show in that life, you know, that someone should want to watch your life? And with that in mind, I want to share with you a little bit about Ham Ben Zion, about Shaul. He was such a great scholar, but he never forgot how to treat people. He never forgot his humility. So listen to this. I want you to understand the power of what it looks like that a person could be so big, but not lose touch with what really matters. There was a, a, a couple in his building that they used to drop off. They would both go out to work. So they didn't know who was going to come home first. So they would always drop a key to the apartment with the rabbi and his wife. He was already an elderly man. They were usually at home. So either he or his wife would be home. And they left the key in their apartment. Anyway, one day, uh, this woman knocks at the door, the rabbi's door. And she said, listen, um, rabbi, did my husband leave me the key? And the rabbi said, no, she, he didn't leave you the key. He's, uh, I guess he must have forgot. There's no, there's no key here on the shelf. He said, but if you want, I'm going now to study. Um, you're more than welcome to stay in the apartment until your husband gets home. She said, thank you so much, Rabbi. Uh, I really appreciate it. Anyway, the rabbi uh, puts on his coat. He leaves to go study. Anyway, the woman is sitting there 5, 10, 15 minutes. Eventually, she realizes, you know what? My husband might not be home for a little while. Why don't I just go and go get the shopping done? She puts on her coat. She, uh, she uh, locks the door of the, the rabbi's door behind her. And she heads downstairs. Who's standing outside the front door of the building in the freezing cold? The rabbi. He made up that he was going to study because he wanted her to stay inside in the, warm, in the warmth of his apartment. But he knew, first of all, she would be uncomfortable standing there alone in the apartment with him. And second of all, maybe there's an issue of Yehud. Rabbi, so he, what did he do? He didn't say a word. He didn't tell her, maybe this, that, I'm not sure. You know, stay here, go in the back room, I'll lock myself in. I'm going to, I'm going to go start, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do something. I'm going to go, I have to go anyway, you know. And he goes and he waits outside. Unbelievable. That was the sensitivity of the rabbi. The rabbi once got off of a bus uh, in Israel. And the bus driver, he noticed that the window was dirty. Anyway, so he sees outside the window that there's a, a young boy there. So he says, hey. And he says, he says, Tinakeli et achalon, vakasha. Please, could you clean the window? And he has a little uh, a dish rag, you know, that he used to... And he throws the rag to the kid outside. Anyway, the rabbi is standing at the bottom. He catches the dish rag. And he climbs up on the bus wheel and he starts wiping the window. He says, Rabbi, what are you doing? Yeah, the bus driver is humiliated. He says, I, I didn't mean I was, I was talking to the kid behind you, Rabbi. I would never have thrown a rag at you tell you to clean my window. The rabbi said, what? what? He says, there's something wrong with helping out another Jew? This is how the rabbi treated him. He looked at himself. This is how the rabbi treated the people, the people around him. He was a person of absolute, in, impeccable integrity, he, of uh, absolute humility, of absolute care and concern, you know, for everyone with him. When the time came in Yehuda Sadka, when uh, Chamezra Atiyah passed away in Porat Yosef, so normally there's a, a struggle for power, who's going to take over? In this yeshiva, it was exactly the opposite. Rabbi Yehuda Tzadka said, I refuse to take the job. Why? Because Ham Ben Zion should be appointed. Ham Ben Zion said, I refuse to take the job. Why? Yehuda Tzadka should be appointed. And anyway, they're fighting back and forth. The yeshiva has no Rosh Yeshiva. A Porat Yosef. So finally, he goes to Rabbi Yehuda Tzadka. He says, Rabbi, why are you not taking the job? The rabbi says, because I think that someone else is more worthy for the job than me. You. <laughs> Sechem Ben-Sio says, well, why do you think I'm more worthy of the job than you? He says, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a rabbi, I'm a, rosh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher in the yeshiva, but you're a posek. You're someone that rules halach, on halachic matters. So you're of a higher level than me, you should run the yeshiva. Sechem ben said, if I'm a posek, then I rule that you have to be the rabbi of the yeshiva, and you have to listen to me. If you decide I had no choice, so he became the rosh yeshiva. In the end, a little a while passed, and the rabbi passed away, 
And Rabbi Chamen Tzion Abash also became the Rosh Shiva of Porat Yosef. But he had such great Talmidim, like Rabbi Reuven Elbaz is his student. Ham Ben Zion Musafi is his student. Ham Yaakov Yosef, Ham Ovadia's son, was his student. He had, uh, he had many great students that went on to lead uh, unbelievable communities and Am Yisrael, but they all shone with that incredible care and concern for someone else. Noach Ish Tzadik, he was Tamim. You know what the, the legacy of a person like Noach is? Noach Matzachen. Noach found favor in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And how do you find favor in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? The Mishnah in Avot says, if a person is Ahuv Lemata, if you are beloved down here on earth, if people love you, if people think that you're great, if people say about you, Mafi Mitlak, then you know what heaven says about you? Mafi Mitlak, there's no one like you. But what we don't realize is, that whether or not we're considered to be nice people or vicious people, whether or not we're considered to be good people, uh, worthy of a legacy, people should say that the person had a Shem Tob, right? Oftentimes, those stories are few and far in between. They happen here and there. It's not something that happens all the time. And oftentimes we're being tested with a specific instance or a specific story. And our legacy is going to be, you know, I want to tell you something. Think back on the people that you know in the community. If, uh, let's say, someone talks to you about Joe Beta, how many stories do people know about Joe Beta? How many stories do you know? People know he started because of this, he did this. Maybe off the back of your head, you know five, ten things about the guy. Charlie Saruya, how many things you know about Charlie Saruya? Five, ten things about the guy. You know, yesterday I mentioned. Leon Betesha Lavashul. Five, ten things about the guy that you know. It's a handful of stories that wind up being the difference between whether you're remembered as a person of compassion, of empathy. And oftentimes we don't recognize those opportunities when they come our way. I want to share with you an incredible story that happened in Yerushalayim. In Yerushalayim, there was a poor, simple man, honest, righteous man. He was a shochet. One night he goes to bed. And he wakes up in the morning and he's shaking. The whole family comes around, they're all nervous, the mother's screaming. What's the matter? The man looks like he's about to faint. He, te- he tells his family, he said, I had the craziest dream. In my dream, he says, I passed away. I went to Shamayim and they're weighing up all of my deeds. And he says, I did okay. But then all of a sudden they walked in and they said, there's one problem. The problem is that once you were a shochet and an almana, a widow came, to you on Erev Shabbat, after you went to the mikveh, after you were getting ready for, you know, you got dressed, and she said, I have no chicken for Shabbat to serve my, my children, the widow, the orphans. Please, could you, she- could you do the shechita for me for the chickens? And, in my, and they said in the dream, and you told this widow, I'm really sorry, I already finished for today, I have no time. You didn't think about this woman, her, this orphan, the, her, this widow. You didn't think about her orphans. And because of that, you have two choices. You could go back to this world, or you could spend 30 days, all expenses paid, Gehinnam. He says, I said to the Malach, I said to the angel, Gehinnam, 30 days, I'm not going back to this world again. I'll live a whole other life to fix, forget it. Who knows, maybe I'll make more mistakes next time, next time around. Send me to Gehinnam. As the Malach is taking me to Gainam, it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, even as we're getting close, until it comes to a point where I can't bear it. It's so hot. The, the heat of Gainam in my dream is so hot. I started begging the angel, please, I want to go back to Bedin. Take me back. I want to choose the other one. I want to go back. I want to choose the other one. The angel said, I'm really sorry. No backsies. I'm screaming. I'm begging. I'm pleading. He says, and that's when I woke up. The, fo- the guy is beside himself. He's going over his life bit by bit. He can't remember ever having such a story. He feels like, you know, I would remember something like that. He thinks, who do I know? Who are the widows in the area? Who are the orphans? He's trying to think that way. On and on and on. Finally, he's so bent out of shape. He tells him to go to the rabbi. He goes to the rabbi. He tells the rabbi his dream. The rabbi says, listen. You went through your life with a fine-tooth comb. He goes, you wrote notes on every Friday. You went back and you looked. 
you can't find any, sh- it must be a dream that, you know, in every dream says the Gemara, there's elements of, uh, of subconscious brain just tossing up nonsense. The simple things, not relevant things. They try to comfort him, but the guy's going nuts. He goes to speak to every chacham, every tzaddik. No one could give him an answer. Until finally, I guess he's convinced, all right, it must be, must be, you know, must be a simple dream. It's not relevant. He calms down. A year goes by, two years, three years, four years. Twenty years go by from the story. One Erev Shabbat, he's on his way to the mikveh. He's getting dressed late. A woman comes up to him. She says, excuse me, is there any way I know it's late? Would you mind, could you slaughter this chicken for me? I don't have any chicken this week, but I didn't go on time. He said, I'm really sorry, I already, I already, you know, I already finished for today. It's very late, I'm really sorry. Next week, if you come a little bit early, I'm happy to help you. Anyway, uh, it's, it's almost Shabbat, Mechilam. So he goes to the mikveh, completely forgotten about his dream. He goes to the mikveh, he gets dressed, he goes to pray. Friday night, he comes home. Shalom Aleichem Aleichem Eshet Chayim Yimtza Right as he finishes Eshet Chayil The man all of a sudden hits him like a ton of bricks His dream wasn't a dream about what was It was a prophecy of something that didn't happen yet Exactly like it happened in the dream It happened in his life And he starts screaming and yelling and crying and pulling his hair out Yani. He doesn't know what to do. He tells his wife and kids, he goes, no one, we're not starting dinner. Go, they go to the kitchen, they load up chicken, meat, potatoes, everything from their own thing. The whole family, the caravan, they take it to the lady's house. She's sitting there, they open up, they put them down. I'm so sorry about today. I completely forgot. Please forgive me. I brought you chicken and meat and potatoes and this. A feast for the family. The woman is so happy. She's crying tears of happiness. I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. The man comes back home, makes kiddush, sings the Shabbat meal, has so, such joy in his heart that he has managed to do the tikkun to fix up uh, the mistake that he dreamed about 20 years before it happened. That night he goes to sleep with a smile on his face and he's ready. You're ready for the dream again, right? <laughs> My friends, he goes to sleep that Friday night and he never wakes up again. That night he passed away in his sleep. How do we know the story? The family themselves, after the Shiva, when they put out a little booklet of all of the deeds of his life, this story actually appears by the family themselves about their father. Now I think to myself when I heard this story, you know, this guy had something that most people don't have. He had a foreshadowing. He was already told from beforehand what the story of his life would become. And now, what's known about this man? This story was very famous in Yerushalayim. Not all of us get a chance to know about a specific action or deed, what is going to be that will become something that become Ele Toldot Shlomo. Ele Toldot Marco. Shai. What are they going to say about me? What are my children going to say? What will my wife tell my children? In, or my grandchildren in 30 years. You know what Jiddo used to do? When they see the kid doing the wrong thing, how do they straighten him out? You know who your grandfather was? Right? What stories are they going to say about me and you? And what is wild is you ask any kid who goes to school, to Jewish school, they can tell you that when Noah built the Teva, he didn't get anyone else to join him. Ask any kid, when Noah went into the Teva, what happened with the lion? One day, he was late to feed the lion. Has he? One day, the guy feeds every animal, the whole time of the mabul, on time. One day, he's late for one, for one feeding, and the lion swipes him because he's hungry. Now all the kids, for all of time, are talking about that story. Imagine when you're in a difficult situation, when you're trying to choose to do the right thing. Think to yourself, they will tell stories about this day. My wife and my kids, even if no one else, even if, not to, if it's not to other people, this is something that becomes the legacy of my life. Cham Ben Sion understood that although he had incredible Torah, what people most often remember, uh, the famous line goes from Maya Angelou, 
in the end, they will not remember what you did, and they will not remember what you said, what they, but they will remember how you made them feel. My friends, take the opportunity, grab each day, make sure that in the, uh, in the, in the, in the history books of your family, they will look back and remember you when the time comes, when your children are growing, when they look back, you know, what a big bracha it is when I hear children say, whenever I'm not sure what to do, I ask myself what my judo would have done, what my father would have done. That's how you know you live the life the right way. When your kids look back to your life for the stories to be the stars that guide them on their journey. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen.